Hi everyone, I'm James from the Freemasons and F9 Audio, and I'm here to talk to you about the origins and history of one of the most important forms of electronic dance music, house music. It's had an enormous effect on my life and my career, and I know it has on so many others. And we're right in the middle of what can be considered the second coming of house music. Now, throughout this video, I want to show you some of the technology that was used and why certain machines were just so important to the early house music pioneers and then take you into Ableton Live and actually show you how to reconstruct and rebuild some of those original house beats in a contemporary manner. The main attraction, the disco demolition spearheaded by morning radio man Steve Dahl and his anti-disco army called the Insane Coho Lips. This is now officially the world's largest anti-disco rally. And the idea of the game was to blow up disco records in a box out in the middle of center field. That did happen, but after that is when the fans overran the field. There was a backlash against disco music from the late 70s and probably into the early 80s. Um, and it caused everything to kind of disappear and go underground. But it didn't mean the music was still not popular. In the post-disco movement, particularly as the drum machines came, came back again, people were able to start experimenting making music at home. And this is absolutely vital to understand exactly what happened within the beginning parts of house music. So think back to the first time that you heard the term house music. Now for me, when I was growing up, every other name of every genre of music kind of made sense, but house was always a bit kind of confusing to understand where it came from. Most other forms of electronic music, we find it quite difficult to actually pinpoint the starting place or a starting point for them, because the producers are spread over many geographical locations. But with house music, we know exactly where and when it actually started. And it was from the early to mid 80s in Chicago. Now this video is being recorded in 2016 and we've had a whole series of conversations about diversity. So from a social point of view, I think it's very important to note that the crowds, DJs and main movers within the house music scene as it developed came from the predominantly Afro-American gay clubs in Chicago. Now let's talk about the name. From 1977 to 1983, there was an incredibly important nightclub in Chicago called The Warehouse and two of its resident DJs, Ron Hardy and Frankie Knuckles, started to play a new type of electronic music that was being actually created physically in Chicago. And if there is gonna be a godfather of house in the same way that James Brown is the godfather of soul, Frankie Knuckles is without doubt the godfather of house music. When interviewed in the late 90s, he said the first time that he actually saw the term house music was on a flyer for a rival club. And at the bottom of the night, it actually had the words, we play house music. And his friends in the car said, look, you've got to realize that's the music you were playing at the warehouse. By then he'd moved on to the power plant. Now there are a couple of other stories as to where the name might have come from. There was a really important underground record shop in Chicago that was stocking and selling all of the music produced locally. Now it had a divider in front of certain bits of vinyl that had the words as heard at the warehouse in front of it. And it's possible that this just may have been shortened to house music later on. Now another story revolves around the fact that pretty much all of the DJs playing in the clubs around Chicago were making their own music. So these were considered the in-house records or the in-house releases by the actual Chicago DJs. Now in reality there was probably no one defining moment it was probably a mixture of all of these stories that brought the term house music together. Now, house music didn't stay in Chicago for very long, but one of the most surprising aspects of the growth of house music is that it, it got across the Atlantic incredibly quickly and was received with open arms in Europe and particularly in the UK. And these guys in Chicago must have been absolutely amazed that what they considered to be an underground movement was suddenly being accepted so much and so well in the UK. Now, I remember the first time I really started to hear the music come into the UK and it was a complete breath of fresh air. Never heard anything like it before because it was just so deliberately repetitive. I remember this music scene absolutely exploding. People from my hometown would suddenly start driving up to the M25, racing around to a whole series of phone boxes, no mobile phones in these days, 
to get hold of the pirate radio station DJs to find out where the actual party was happening. And it became such an enormous culture in the UK that the government decided, as they always try to do, to legislate to actually stop it. And we had some bills passed here that was were almost going to stop the parties or anything that were playing. And I remember the term directly. It was an incredibly important term, repetitive beat. Now, it was around this time that all of the different subgenres of house started to develop. And although that everyone involved in the scene recently may think that Deep House is a new term, it's actually been around since the very, very early days. If you think of Acid House, that was way back in Chicago as well. Techno split off very, very early from the Detroit producers. Even the likes of Garage, which we've always assimilated with the uh, underground sound of the UK, it was named after a garage nightclub originally in the States that was a lot more soulful. So now let's talk about the actual music itself. And as I said before, it is defined particularly by having a kick drum, one on each of the main beats of the bar. Uh, open hi-hats, now that came from disco, that was a direct reference to disco. And this is where it's important. Some of the early house records were always actually just trying to copy the disco records that they'd heard before, but on cheap electronic equipment. And a perfect example of exactly that process is On and On by Jesse Saunders, as it actually uses the exact notes from a disco bass line, but played on a synthesizer. If you think about how all club music was made in the 1970s, it all had to be recorded live, which meant it was incredibly studio based. The one thing that came along and changed all of that was the drum machine. And in particular with house music, at the very early stages, two drum machines were influencing it more than anything else. The 808 and the 909. And some incredible records were being made by forward-thinking producers such as Kraftwerk and the Yellow Magic Orchestra. So if we look at one of the most important drum machines from the Roland Corporation, the 909, how did it end up in the hands of the house producers? Roland's original drum machine, the 808, used a whole series of analog circuits to make it sound, so it wasn't particularly realistic. They were just trying to make drum machines that would compete with the American smash drum machines that were used in pop at the time, uh, like the Lindrum and the Oberheim DMX. They were always aiming to try and get a cheaper version of the Lindrum, which was heavily sample based. And the kind of middle drum machine was actually the 909, which used analog circuits for a lot of the principal sounds, but to get more realism into the hi-hats and the cymbals, used a very early version of sampling technology. Now, oddly, it wasn't particularly successful when it came out, the 909, and they actually dropped the price. And as the producers of Chicago were trying to find the cheapest way to make records, the 909 became incredibly popular amongst them. And as I say, this is just one of those twists of fate that happens to define an entire genre of music. Another record that really changed everything was Mars Pump Up The Volume. And both Steve Silk Hurley's Jack Your Body and Mars Pump Up The Volume relied on a really important piece of brand new music technology that was gonna change music forever, the sampler. Now, sampling technology had been around for a while but it was mainly coming in the kind of workstations that would actually cost the price of a house. And I'm here I'm talking about the Fairlights and the Synclaviers. But two very forward-thinking companies, and with the explosion of cheap electronics, were able to develop sampling technology that could get into the hands of the underground producers. And namely, EMU systems from America that had taken the same technology from their massive Emulator 2 system and condensed it into the SP-1200 and the SP-12 drum machines. And Akai from Japan, that were developing a small range of modular samplers and also the beginnings of the MPC system. Now we have to really think about what sampling allowed producers to do because up until this point people were only able to be influenced by the music that they wanted to sound like and actually replay it using say electronic instruments or their own live instruments. When sampling came along all of that changed because now you could just lift sections from records that you liked and cut and paste them back together. And Mars Pump Up the Volume for me is a perfect example of that. But if there's one resounding sonic signature that stayed with all the versions of house music and has come all the way back to the fall right now, it's the sound of the Roland TR909 drum machine. And the TR, by the way, stands for Transistor Rhythm. So let's dive right in now and see why this one particular drum machine, the 909 from the Roland Corporation in Japan, was so vital to the development of house music. <laughs> 
So this is it, the TR909 from the Roland Corporation. It was released in about 1984. Now, there's one thing I just want to say. This isn't a standard 909. This actually uh, has been lent to me by Paul Hartnell of Orbital. And he did tell me a funny story that, in fact, he didn't really want to buy a 909. He was after a 707 because all the records he loved uh, were on a 707. He did describe it as bat warm, but for me, I've seen things in far worse condition. This is actually a beautiful sounding unit. And let's be clear about exactly what everything was trying to achieve back then. This wasn't trying to actually create a machine for an underground form of music. This was trying to sound as realistic as possible in terms of real drums. But it's a hybrid machine. It uses two types of technology. Let me just play you through some of the core sounds. Kick drum, snare, the toms, the rim shot and the hand clap. Now, all of these are actually generated by analog circuits. And because of that, we've got a few little controls we can twiddle about with on the individual sounds. But the one thing I haven't mentioned yet are the actual metalwork of the drum kit, the hi-hat and the cymbals. Now, Roland had actually had quite a lot of success previously with the analog circuits of the TR-808, but they still weren't happy with what they could get out for the kind of uh, hi-hats or cymbal sounds within it. So here you've got a really early version of sampling technology. And it quite famously, one of the engineers involved in the, the, the development of the TR-909 was actually a drummer. So he brought his metalwork in, he brought his hi-hats, he brought his cymbal and his ride in. And then the engineers at the Roland Corporation started taking what have to be some of the most important samples ever in dance music, the 909 hi-hats. The 909 crash. And the 909 ride. Now there's one more thing I need to quickly mention. The Roland Corporation, by the time this was kind of released and out there, had already developed the TR-707, a direct response to the sample drum machines of America like the Lindrums and the Oberheim DMXs. So they felt this was a kind of a fairly a poor man's version of a modern drum machine, so they dropped the price. And this put it perfectly in the hands of the original house pioneers. Now, bearing in mind they were trying to copy originally some of the disco records that they remember from early clubbing days, and it was a, just a kind of perfect thing that sometimes happen was, happens within music technology where a whole series of technologies come together and the beginning of a movement to create a classic sound. So I've programmed in here a kind of standard house beat and the moment I press play you're going to hear a kind of rhythm track that you've heard hundreds if not thousands of times before. Now the 909 programming system, I mean the whole thing looks similar to the early computer technology that was going out, even these buttons seem similar to the things like the TRS-80s, the home computers that were around at the time. Um, but it had a very simple 16 step sequencer that allowed you to create one bar at a time. So it's easily apparent as to why some of the rhythms that were always been associated with the early movements in house came about. Okay, so now let's just look at some of the individual sounds in a little bit more detail and the controls that you've got. One of the classic things about the 909 that made it so perfect for a new emerging form of electronic dance music was this kick drum. Because you could control the length of it from either incredibly short to much longer. Now if you think about the club music of the day, it had either been reliant on live kick drums which have an in normally an incredibly short attack portion, not much sustain. Um, or sample drum machines that are kind of emulating that sound in the first place anyway. But here you had something that had also much more control than an 808. You've got some rudimentary tuning controls, which doesn't really affect the actual body of it, but mainly the attack portion. And a control that will make some changes to the attack portion. Now the snare is also a classic. You can go from anything from quite dull and bring in a noise circuit there, as well as extend out to that classic house snare that we've heard just a million times. Now the toms, once again analog circuits, you've got some rudimentary tuning controls, very handy. Um, if your bass line is in a particular key, you can kind of uh, tune these to get them to fit a little bit better, as well as some decay controls. Rim shot and hand clap just literally have level controls. But it's in the hi-hat section when we're starting to get into this early part of the sampling um, that it starts to get really interesting. 
and for two reasons. For a start, we've got the closed hat decay amount and an open hat decay amount. Now, okay, in today's uh, multifaceted and um, macro-driven uh, VSTs, that might actually sound incredibly basic. But this and some of the human functions or humanizing functions of the rhythm controller are actually some of the most important parts of this machine and what made it this actual sound and the grooves that came out of it so iconic. Now, just moving on in the cymbals, we've got some uh, a control over the tuning of the sample of the crash. And the ride cymbal. Now, let me show you some of these in action. And I've got a very simple pattern here, which is just literally the closed hi-hats on every 16, every one of the 16 beats of one bar. But let me show you what can happen once we start actually changing the decay control on the closed hat. And now if you bring the kick drum in, and we're already starting to get a more interesting pattern, but it's fascinating that the kind of almost relentless machine-like um, sound of the hi-hats already kind of brings back memories of some of the early house music. And you can see why this must have just been a revelation, particularly on a big club system. Now there was one other set of controls in here that you could add to the rhythm programming that would add a level of humanization. And for me, it's one of the most iconic, particularly when we come to these hi-hat samples. And that is a series of accents. Now what I mean by accents is a couple of systems that will allow you to change the volumes of particular notes in a pattern. And there's almost two layers of that within the 909. Let me show you what I mean. We've got a quick little house pattern with just the clap. And I'm gonna add to it 16th um, hi-hat close notes across the whole bar. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but when I actually press play, all of the, um, the lights within the, the, the bar measure for this particular instrument are flashing, which means they're at the first level of volume. If I were to hit any one of the different beat divisions again, the light will come on steady, which means it's actually going to play that sound uh, slightly louder. So already we're starting to get a slightly different feel from this just by adding um, those particular accents. But the entire machine also has a, a system called Total Accent and a knob control for it here, which will allow you to create a user-defined rhythmic push or sonic push across the entire drum machine and all of its sounds. And I can get to that by, um, if I actually start to add the open hi-hats in traditional house form here. Oops. Now you hear there that the closed hi-hat is actually almost louder than the open hi-hat. But if I add an accent on all of the beats where I've selected an open hi-hat, then I can push that open hi-hat louder than ever. Now, if we start to muck around with these total accents, particularly if we've got them on all of the principal beats, and then start to add more modulation from that closed hat decay, you can really start to hear how some of these original and classic house beats were put together. And it was the interplay between these different accent systems that really allowed you to build up some perfect hi-hat patterns that just really came to life as you were actually going through the bar. Now there's one more trick in our rhythm programming arsenal, when we're, especially when we're talking about house beats, and that is swing or shuffle. 
Now, the history of swing is kind of uh, an interesting subject all on its own. And really, I suppose the first drum machine to really have it applied was the Lindrum. And it had swings ranging from 16A to 16F. Now, if you go back into anyone using logic out there, go back into your quantizers, you'll see that these are perfectly referenced within the basic swing quantize system of logic as well. But they were starting to appear on Roland's drum machines as well. And it's become an iconic part of house production. Now, this has only got a few selections of swing settings. So to, to show you more what swing and shuffle can do, I've actually got this linked up with a Roland SBX1 sync box via Sync24. So pulses are coming into this machine um, that allow me to kind of show you more what shuffle is capable of. So I'm gonna play the pattern back now. So that's straight and now let's start to add shuffle. Now I'm sure there you can hear the rhythm parts actually start to kind of slide off from each other and create this groove that you've heard countless times across hip hop and house productions. But I think it's really important to kind of work out how exactly you should be applying this within your productions inside your DAW and learning all the tricks of the different swings and this kind of accented system where you can push certain notes in terms of volume. Getting these exactly right will really help you hone your skills as, uh, as a beat programmer in the classic house genre.